what we do as men oftentimes is we'll take something as beautiful as sex that should cause us to be in awe of the Lord. And instead of using it as what I call a wellspring for worship, we end up using it as a weapon for wounding. Welcome to the Dial In Podcast. My name is Johnny Artavanis, and I've got an exciting episode for you folks today because I'm sitting with Emil Zawain, and uh, he just re released a book called Fight Like a Man, A Bold Biblical Battle Plan for Personal Purity. Easy, Emil, thank you for hopping on the show today. Uh, I'd love to just ask you right off the bat, tell everybody a little bit more about yourself, your family, what you do for a living at Living Waters, and then we'll dive into really more of the content and subject of this book. Thanks, Johnny. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it's a blessing to know the person interviewing you on a personal level, and I'm blessed by our friendship and excited to talk about the book. But yeah, uh, you got it right, Emil Zwayne born in Lebanon, uh, immigrated to the US back in the 1980s, got saved wow. back in 1991, had a crazy insane past and uh, the Lord just snatched me up August 15th, like I said, of 91. Uh, wow. And by God's grace, I've been serving as a president of Living Waters now since, uh, let's see, I think it's coming on uh, 22 years this January. Wow. Uh, married, uh, five kids, uh, one of each, fascinating creatures of God and um, been, uh, yeah, doing the work here at Living Waters with Ray Comfort. I don't know if you mentioned mm -hmm. this, but Ray Comfort also happens to be my father-in-law and uh, we've been teaming up for a long time. We're gonna start a new mattress company called Easy Comfort together. I like it. Yeah, that's, I like it. That's gonna be our claim to fame. So uh, hey, so there's yeah. a lot of mattress companies. You might have a lot of competition. Come on, man, so. Easy Comfort. You can't beat that name. It's not that is not yeah. a bad game. And we're we're um, we're Jew and Arab, so that that makes it all the more interesting. That's a perfect combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, well, I'm thankful to have you on, and uh, as I said, you know, your your ministry is so thankful for it, and the heartbeat for evangelism that your father-in-law exhibits, and really your whole ministry is about and reaching people. Uh, for Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm so thankful for his passion for evangelism that I've known about Ray Comfort uh, since I was a boy. And so I'm really thankful for your ministry. Now, as I mentioned, your your book is on really sexual purity, per personal purity, and it's a needed subject. I've, you know, spoken on the topic of sexual purity, you know, ranging from junior hires to grown men. And it's a battle that is fairly pervasive. You know, I often give the stats that the porn industry is bigger than CBS, NBC, and ABC combined. It's bigger than the NFL, NBA, NFL combined. 94% of 11 year olds have seen pornography. Hmm. You know, and the average age of first exposure to pornography is I think 10 years old. And so right. this is a, a prevalent problem, not just pornography speaking, but just sexual purity at large. So I'd love to just ask you easy, obviously, I mentioned some stats, but what was behind the burden? You were talking to me just before we got on the call here about the burden you had to write this book on sexual purity. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, you, you nailed it, Johnny. It's, it's a massive problem that I don't think has been even properly quantified as much as people try to quantify it. It's huge. You know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to access pornography, you had to steal a magazine from a friend's house because his dad had a stash or he had to go to a video yeah. store and try to steal a video or whatever. But now if you think about it, uh, every single man at the tip of his fingers has this device that can instantly yeah. connect him to millions of images. And having pastored myself for six years, I know you're a pastor yourself and, and continuing to counsel people now, couples and individual men, this, this issue is ravaging people. And once yeah. in a while it surfaces and we, we pay some attention to it, but then it goes right back underground because no one wants to talk about it. It's not a comfortable subject. Uh, and yet it's, it's destroying everything that it touches. So yeah. I, I looked around and, and I thought, okay, this is a big problem. I have a passion to address this problem, uh, but there are a lot of books out there on the subject. And so what would mm -hmm. make this book that, that I've written different? And that's that I wanted it number one to be biblically based but then I wanted it to be theologically sound because you have books that purport to be based on scripture, but they're not theologically sound. And then I, I wanted at the same time, a book to be gospel centric and not, not 
yeah. the gospel only being the tool through which we're saved, but the the treasure house from which we yeah. live as believers, all of its benefits sure. apply to us uh, for all things that pertain to life and godliness. But then I wanted a book that was radically practical so that it hit all of those sweet spots, but that men could read it and then be able to really apply it in a tangible and practical way. And that's why the subtitle is A Bold Biblical Plan for Personal Purity. Hmm. Well, I'm thankful for the burden that you've had to write on a needed subject. Um, you know, we mentioned kind of the prevalence of the issue today. Um, and, and even as you said, you just have to, you know, go to a gas station or, or whatever it may be, or steal a magazine from a father's house. And right. I forget who, who said it, but now there's a brothel in every pocket. Ooh. Just, you know, a, just instant exposure to a world of iniquity. Yeah. And yeah. this is, you know, um, again, if you're a junior hire or an old man, um, this is not a problem, particularly for just young men. It's, I've talked to a guy recently that's seventies in his seventies that just told me this is a battle yeah. every single day of my life. Now, I, I think because we, we talk about these, you know, you have the word battle plan within your very title. Let's just talk historically speaking. Let's go biblically speaking. Yeah. Why has this been such a large issue? Not just, you know, we talk about the way that maybe the pornographic world is shifting, mm. but sexual purity is not a new battle. It's actually been one of Satan's main arrows yeah. for thousands of years. And maybe just talked about that for a moment and why in particular you think Satan uses this particular temptation uh, with so many men. Yeah, well, Satan is a master at taking what God has initially designed for good and perverting it and twisting it. And one of the things I talk about in the book is how what we do as men oftentimes is we'll take something as beautiful as sex that should cause us to be in awe of the Lord. And instead of using it as what I call a wellspring for worship, we end up using mm -hmm. it as a weapon for wounding. And so Satan will, will take the very thing through which God replicates image bearers and ends up using it as, as a great weapon for the destruction of men's souls. And scripture is clear, you know, that, that any sin that a man commits, uh, you know, he commits outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And so it brings radical devastating effects with it and it's so tied into our drive as men uh, in connection yeah. with the design of God to create oneness on so many levels between a man and a woman, not just uh, physically, but, but, but other levels as well. And he takes it and he twists it and he perverts it. But when you think about it, Johnny, you know, the things that are involved in what ends up being sexual immorality, I mean, you've got vision, right? You think of the human eye, 137 million light sensitive cells built into per sensitive light meter, wide angle lens, full color instantaneous reproduction. And, and instead of being in awe that I have vision, we take it and we, we look at images that we, we shouldn't look at. We look at women in a lustful way. You have cognition, the processing of those images. I mean, your brain is beyond any human machine that could ever be conceived. There's no computer on earth that could compare to it. Uh, and then you have coition, which is coitus or, or the, 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 you know, the, the mechanism of intercourse. And you look at, and you see God's fingerprints all over that. And yet we take it and we twist it. And instead of using it as a wonder for worship, we use it as a weapon, like I said, for wounding. Hmm. Now you, um, you know, even as I, I think through what you said, you, you mentioned a verse that Paul, uh, talks about in first Corinthians six, right? That every other sin a man commits or an individual commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. You know, one of the things I often think about is sometimes we talk about the reality that all sin is equally uh, sinful, right? All sin separates us from God. But sometimes people say, well, what's the difference between my struggle with pornography and your struggle with anger? Well, I would say, well, the Bible says there is something unique and um, different about sexual sin. That's why Paul says, I think it's first Corinthians six, 18, every other sin is different than sexual sin. And you kind of talk about that because it involves our drive. It involves the three factors that you mentioned. Um, you know, maybe break down for us easy in your book. You talk about the, the three main elements that men have to battle in their fight for sexual purity. Um, talk about those enemies and why it's important that we even, you know, Sun Tzu used to say, we need the first thing in 
our battle is we have to know the enemy. So yeah. what are those enemies and why do we need to understand those enemies? Absolutely. And to those listening, these enemies are, are nothing new. It, it, they are the traditional standard ancient enemies of man and they are the world, the flesh and the devil. But it's important, I think, to, to recognize and understand that as mm-hmm. Dr. John Street said in his amazing book, Passions of the Heart, he said that you know Satan and the world are outward enemies of opportunity. That the real enemy is is really the flesh itself. It's that fallen, sinful nature. And so the world and the devil come alongside the the real enemy, which is the flesh, and they become allies with it, and they begin to coordinate against our soul. And so, yeah, it's really important for men to, to understand who the enemy is, and and the problem, Johnny oftentimes is that men don't understand the enemy. And alongside with that, they're not ready for the war because they don't realize they're in war. There's a delusion that's going on. And, you know, I I talk about it in the book in, in regards to a man being deluded into thinking that he's on a luxury cruise ship heading for the shores of Bora Bora, when in reality, he's on a Higgins boat heading for the shores of World War II Normandy. And can you imagine yeah. a guy with this deluded mindset? I mean, he's gonna saunter off yeah. the Higgins boat clad in a bathrobe, some fluffy slippers and a remote control in his hand. And we both know that this guy's gonna get smoked. And so, yeah. so that's what's going on. And, and those are the three primary enemies. They have undeniable tactics against us. They're nothing new. And we need to understand uh, the way they work. And then we need to have our counterattack. And that's what I talk about in the book. Yeah, and even just, Along the lines of those three realities, you know, scripturally speaking, we know that the world is against us and wants to conform us, right? That's Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world because the world does want to conform us. Right. We know that the flesh is set out to destroy us because that's James 1. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, but each one is tempted when he is led away by his own lust and own right. desires. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so you have the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we know in First Peter that the devil is prowling like a roaring lion yeah. seeking to destroy. Maybe just in along that lines of the devil, you know, I think we often live in an environment that either hyper spiritualizes the devil's activity. You know, C.S. Lewis used to talk about how there's a danger of you find a devil under every rock. Yeah. You're that type of person, or you just think he's not existent. We 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 forget the reality that evil is embodied and out to destroy us. Yeah. Why is it important that we have maybe a greater awareness of the fact that the devil is seeking to actively destroy men uh, in regards to their sexual purity. And how, why are we maybe so prone to forget that reality? Yeah, well, you know, again, we're, we're moved by what we see, even in terms of how our sexual sin is impacting us in terms of our spiritual man and, and uh, internally, you know, I often say if our lungs were hanging on the outside of our chest and we could see them, you'd have a lot less smokers in the world. But, you know, guys are puffing away and they're destroying their lungs and they can't see what's going on. Yeah. You've seen those pictures. I'll show you the before, the after and the, the charred lung. But if someone could see that, they would understand what's going on. And so and so it is with what's happening internally, but the same holds true with, with the enemy of our souls in that we can't see them obviously. And there is, I think that other extreme of chalking everything up you know, to just the physical battle, but we battle not against flesh and, uh, flesh and blood. We know that that's a reality. And he does, as you cited, prowl about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Paul said, you know, that he's not ignorant of his schemes. We can't be ignorant yeah. of his schemes. And so he's a one trick pony in the sense that there's nothing new with his tactic. It just morphs and, and kind of gets yeah. adapted, right? To the, to, the, to the new era or maybe the particular sin. But with Adam and Eve, you know, he hit them at the beginning with discontentment. As God said, you can't eat of every tree of the garden. And God had said they could eat of every, he restricted them from the single tree, right? Of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gave them dominion over the entire planet. The, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was microscopic and invisible. If you can imagine from space compared to the scope of the rest of the planet, yet he worked discontentment in their heart. And so men, men for their good are, commanded by God to abstain from sexual morality. And it's not just pornography, obviously we've been talking about that, yeah. but it goes into all other different sorts of yeah. forms of sexual sin, but he, he creates this discontentment. You can't have this. And so instead of being filled with gratitude for the overwhelming blessings of God that are bound in our lives, we, we take that bait and we allow it to destroy us. 
And then there's, there's that, that, that aim towards um, not just discontentment, but also disbelief in terms of the ramifications of sin. So no, you shall not die. Satan says to Adam and Eve, you shall not die. And so men are deceived into thinking that the consequences for sexual sin, as you highlighted, are not as serious as they are. And then finally it's deification. No, ultimately you will become like God, knowing good from evil. You will be the arbiter of what is right or what is wrong in your own life, ultimately autonomy. And it's the same yeah. thing with sexual sin. Ultimately it's, hey, in a sense to take the mantra used for abortion, my body, my choice, I could do whatever I yeah. want with it. And so the, those are the main tactics that Satan is still employing against men. Yeah, and it's so true. So you, you, you just said uh, discontentment, disbelief, a failure to believe that God is for you and that God is a restricting straight jacket to true pleasure right. rather than the fountain spring of true joy. Yeah. And then you just third mentioned deification that ultimately we, we act as the sovereign in our life. Absolutely. When we, don't abide and submit to God's design for our sexuality, which again, I think it's worth mentioning that I, I forget who said it, but I always used to tell students that we were sexual before we were sinful. Mm. And, you know, God's, uh, be, you know, before the fall, God made people sexual beings. That's not Amen. a bad thing. It's a good thing that God created that for his glory. Right. And I think especially in a church context, sometimes we, we fail to mention that you know, sexual, a sexual drive is a good thing. God made it for his glory. But at, to your point, the first thing that Satan does in the garden is distort. Yeah. God made a good thing. It's beautiful, Johnny. In. in fact, yeah. you know, when we, when we first had the, the sex talk with our kids uh, and we have five kids. And so, you know, we, we did it with each of them at different stages. But I told my wife, I said, you know, yeah. when we sit down with the kids, I want to present this in the beauty that that truly applies to yeah. it. You know, most parents are nervous, anxious. Oh, you know, their eyes are just going back and forth. They're sweating. We told the kids in the morning, hey, tonight we want to talk to you about something amazing, something beautiful that God yeah. made. And so it's important to highlight that and note it. Well, we're not talking about something you know, Shameful. perverted, unclean. Yeah. God designed it. He created it. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Satan has twisted it and it's time to reclaim it for God's glory in the right way. I think what you're saying is so important in regards to the way that you communicate sex to your children. You know, when I was growing up, sex was, I think, a very faux pas topic. Mm. And you were basically successful as a student growing up in the church if you did not have sex, right. you know, if you were a virgin. Oh. And it, it gave the impression that, it can give the impression at least, depending on the way you communicate it as a pastor and as a parent, that sex is something to just stay away from and that it's kind of gilded with shame. Oh. And it's a... And so I think actually what it does is elicit curiosity mm. if, you know, but if a parent doesn't communicate the beauty of sex to their kids right. and what it is, uh, they'll go Google it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, someone's going to teach the next generation about sex. Yeah. It's either going to be Absolutely. The family or the world. Yeah. I love that illustration that says, you know, our children's minds are like warehouses full of empty shelves and whoever gets there first and stocks those shelves with whatever knowledge or truth or lies, they're gonna make it that much harder for someone else to come and unstock and restock those shelves. And so we wanna beat the world to it with our children. And, and even as adults, you know, we, we want yeah. to inform our minds properly with what the word has to say about it. And a lot of people have experienced it in a sinful context in whatever way, yeah. you know, whether before they came to Christ or even in ways they stumbled as a believer before marriage. And so it's important to reorient our hearts and minds with scripture. And also for men to recognize, I think another big lie, John, if I can kind of interject yeah, with that please. here, you know, there's that, that lie in men's minds that they just can't help it. You know, those that are addicted or rather in bondage yeah. to pornography, uh, we're so accustomed to using the word addicted. And, and I think it's, it's yeah. not really the proper word, uh, but, but, but there's that bondage to sexual immorality. They think, you know, I just can't help it. And that's the biggest lie. And I often ask men, I say, look, if Elon Musk put a hundred million dollars in an escrow account, and you know yeah. that if you went six months without looking at pornography, you'd get that hundred million dollars, right? You know, there's no question yeah. you would do whatever it takes to do it and you would succeed. And so it's not a question of can we, but will we, will we yield to the Lord? Will we recognize the sweetness of that good word, repentance? Yeah. There is repentance, yeah. there's hope in the Lord. And that's the beauty of the gospel. And that's where, you know, those aspects of the book 
being gospel centric comes in that because of the gospel, there is hope, forgiveness, and, and the ability to walk in newness of life in that regard. Now, Easy, you've talked about the reality that there's those three main enemies. That's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And those are nothing new. You've already established those have been the same kind of uh, enemies that the image bearers of God have kind of navigated for thousands and thousands of years. Now, if it's the same enemy, the same problem, one of the things that you've alluded to in regards to being a gospel-centric solution is that believers now are equipped with the same remedy, and that's the scripture. So maybe talk about the the remedy of that maybe you would prescribe or the, the great physician prescribes to those who are struggling and battling. And that's a key word because I think sometimes we say, I don't know if everybody is even battling. Sometimes I think they're just losing, right? Because to your point, they just think they're addicted, right? So it's, it's yeah. just losing language, but we need to, First Peter 1 13, prepare our minds for action. Yeah. Uh, I know you have a principle in your book that you call the note principle. So just talk about uh, the scripture's battle plan. Yeah. You call it that in your book, but what's the principles that you've put in place in the book for personal purity? Yeah, for sure. And and I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of some are not battling. Battle is, is good. It's indicative of resistance. It's indicative yeah. of being in the fight versus surrendering and giving up. And so the, the first and most important thing is to recognize again, that in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so the enemy uh, will con you into sin. Our flesh will lead us into sin, the world will influence us towards sin. And ultimately we make the decision to enter into sin and we bear the responsibility. But we need to recognize that we can, we can make the decision then to repent because after those elements have led us into sin, then enters the realm of condemnation. And so you battle back with, with the truth of God's word. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You get up and then you begin to yeah. implement the battle plan to resist each one against Satan in terms of recognizing his, his reality as an enemy and recognizing the victory you have over him, in, over him in Christ, battling his lies with truth, taking up the, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and being yeah. men that are rooted and grounded in the word. You, you resist the flesh by recognizing that the remedy to the flesh is walking in the spirit, which means to be governed or yeah. controlled by the spirit of God. And you do that by engaging yourself in the things that the spirit of God is engaged in. And this is where the tragedy comes in, Johnny, because oftentimes we're looking for remedies in every direction when God's word has given us the ultimate remedies yeah. Yeah. right beneath our nose in the treasure house of God's word. And, and they're things yeah. we're familiar with. And so we just neglect them, but, but yeah. the spirit is involved number one in the word scripture is called the sword of the spirit. The spirit is involved in prayer. We don't know how to praise we ought. The spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep to utter. We don't know uh, the spirit is involved in evangelism. Uh, when the spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And the spirit is involved in, a, in fellowship as scripture talks about the fellowship of the spirit and that dynamic being interrelated with the Holy Spirit. And so we immerse ourselves in those things passionately and, and proactively. And then finally, we recognize that the, that the world is gonna come at us with its ways and its foolish wisdom. And so we counter yeah. that by not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We examine what we let into our lives and our hearts and into, into our homes, what we put before our eyes. And uh, we take heed to Philippians 4, 8 and make that the uh, pathway through which we resist the world's influence because the world has a big bully pulpit and it's coming at us. But the note principle, do I have time to, to wrap it yeah. up with that? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, so, yeah, please. you know, I was counseling a young man one day and uh, asked him how he was doing, it, it, you know, with the, with the porn struggle. And he said, man, I'm doing really well. I said, how are you doing as you go about your day? You know, and women cross your path, how are you doing in the area of lust? So he yeah. hung his head kind of in, in regret and sort of embarrassed me. He said, I'm not really doing, really doing too well in that area. And then I sense this like zeal and passion for righteousness and purity rise up in my heart. And I said, brother, you know what? We just have to have this attitude where we just, we just say, nope, I'm not gonna give into this. I'm not gonna allow myself to be lured into this. And we get this kind of attitude and we even declare it out loud. Nope, I'm not gonna do it. So the next day I'm, I'm driving uh, into the office and the thought pops into my mind. I thought, man, I wish there was an acrostic that could connect with that word nope. And as soon as yeah. I thought it, it popped into my mind and it's nope, N-O-P-E, not one peak even. 
And, uh, you know, and you think about how it's just that first peak that you, that, that you allow yourself to give into that leads to a stare and that leads to that desire uh, developing in your heart. And so, yeah. so that, that hit me really hard. And then I thought, man, why though not one peak even? Uh, not internally, uh, in terms of my mind's eye, not with my physical eye. And I thought, because it's fueled by the things that I love. Yeah. And there are five things that I love that fuel me in that regard. Number one, I love my Lord above all else. And I don't wanna dishonor him and disglorify him. I love my lady, the one that I've committed to be faithful to, the one that has become yeah. one with me. I don't wanna wound her and hurt her. I love my, uh, my uh, legacy um, or my lineage. I love my children and my grandchildren and those that are, uh, are to come after them. And I don't wanna ruin that example that I am to them. And then uh, I, I love his lambs. I love God's people uh, that I'm called to be an example to and to impact. And then I love the lost, those that I'm called to be a witness yeah. to as an ambassador for Christ. So mm. those are the five loves that fuel me as I say, not one peak even for the glory of God. Yeah. Well, I love the analogy, not one peak even, you know, and it's a biblical thing because Paul says, not even a hint Amen. of sexual immorality must even, he says, even be named among you. It should be so far, so distinct, so separated from right. the life of a believer. That, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's not even a hint. Amen. And you know, for the men that are listening right now, uh, I know that, you know, when this subject comes up and men are enmeshed in this and embroiled in it, it yeah. it's one of those things where they just kind of want to run. But again, man, I want to encourage you to recognize the hope that you have in Christ, that he specializes in restoration. He specializes yeah. in renewal. And even though you're thinking, I've been in this for a long time, there's hope for you in Christ. There's hope in the benefits that we have in the gospels believers. And for you women that are listening to, whose husbands are struggling or whose sons are struggling, uh, don't give up crying out to the Lord for them and, and, and speaking truth into their life from the depth of your soul of how destructive and harmful this is. And it's just my prayer that the Lord will, will take this book and, and use it as a tool. I've been blessed by the response. You know, Johnny, Dr. John MacArthur endorsed the book. He said, every man needs yeah. the help this excellent book offers. And uh, yeah. Ken Ham wrote the foreword to it. It's been endorsed by a number of different Christian leaders. And even in pre-release, I was blown away and blessed by the success it had on uh, Amazon. It had hit number one in its category and was one of the top books on there. And so it's uh, it's an encouragement. Praise the Lord. I uh, I think, you know, easy, if you have a minute, I think any conversation on sexual purity is lacking without maybe two final nuggets. And I want to just alley-oop you. No. I'm a... Uh, you know, I can be John Stockton. You can be Carl Malone. <laughs> I'm ready to dunk, brother. I'm sorry to call you Carl Malone, but I had uh, <laughs> one, and you mentioned it, but it's worth punctuating. Oh. Uh, in regards to the no, nope principle, yeah, I, I think, think, you know, that's that's a biblical reality. Romans 13, 14, make no provision for the flesh. Yeah. And you could say not a single peak. Hmm. Talk about the importance of just in, for a moment on the transformation of our affections because we can cut off every avenue to sin and our hearts still not be changed. Yeah. And so you mentioned Philippians 4.8, um, talk about the importance and the reality and the promise. You, t you mentioned the hope that God can actually change yeah. what you crave. Right. And that's, what I think, the most hopeful thing for any mo man in, enmeshed in this sin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it, it ultimately comes down to the fear of God because you can you can implement every sort of safeguard that you want. But if your heart is not changed, if, if you don't walk in that awe and that reverence yeah. And, yeah. and that adoration of the Lord, then, then it's all, it's all yeah. gonna fall apart. And so, so it comes down to, to becoming a man who truly makes Christ your everything, who, who yeah. repents and returns to your first love. And you know, who understands that when you sin in this way, you are sinning in the shadow of the cross. And yeah. in essence, you're saying what Christ did really meant nothing. And, and so you're spurning the cross. And that's one of the points that I touch on in the book. There are these six C's, I call them the six C's to succeed. And, and one of them is, is cross. And that, that principle, it's an alliterated sentence that men memorize and again, helps them in the battle and keeping with this battle plan. And that is stop spitting and stomping on such a sacred symbol. Stop treating the cross as though it means nothing. And, and so when you, you know, as Peter talks about, he gives that whole, in second yeah. Peter one, he gives that whole list of virtues that should mark us as believers. And then he says, he who lacks these things is short-sighted, 
even to blindness and has forgotten his yeah. purification from his old sins. Yeah. Which means in yeah. essence, Johnny, we, we've, we've lost sight of our redemption, which means we've lost sight of our redeemer. And so yeah. it means we need to come back to the knowledge of Christ, come back to intimate fellowship with him, come back to valuing his preciousness and having a heart that says, I yeah. don't wanna sin against such a sweet and precious savior. Yeah, and that's just the heartbeat of the Psalms, you know, creating me yeah. a clean heart. God, give me a desire that loves holiness. Yeah. yeah. A desire that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. There's a promise there to see Christ more fully. I mean, that's my motivation for holiness this is, is I wanna see more of God. Yeah. Um, and you talk about the awe and reverence for God, which is I think fitting. And then just lastly, you in the title, you have the language of a battle. You mm -hmm. gave me the analogy of the contrast of a guy wearing a robe and slippers and then a man who's getting off of a boat, yeah. World War II Normandy. The danger in any, you know, and, and in any subject that we're reading about individually is to think we can go about this battle alone. Right. And, you know, battles are fought with comrades and yeah. with men in the trenches. Yeah. And I think there's a danger of reading a book alone and in praying front. alone and yeah, reading the Bible, Bible alone, which may be good disciplines, right? Hmm. But battles are fought with brothers. Yeah. And so just maybe talk about that reality uh, for a moment. Yeah, you know, honestly, Johnny, if, if it weren't for the men that have been a part of my life for years, some of them decades, um, there's no way I, I could have even come close to writing a book like this because again, the enemy assails all of us as men. And the reason why I, I think I'm so connected to the book is because I'm a man and I have the same nature as men and I understand the lure and the temptations yeah. that bombard us. But brothers in your life, you know, there, there are a number of different men that I meet with on a regular basis for, for accountability, for prayer, for a sounding board. You know, sometimes I look yeah. at believers that have been in Christ for years and years, but their, their growth is stunted because they live in an echo chamber and they don't have other men that are asking them the hard questions that are calling them to account and that are, that are yeah. sharing with them ideas and thoughts and, and biblical principles through which they can grow and, and be protected. Yeah. In fact, the, um, my wife and I, there's a couple that we've been meeting with for years. And recently we started kind of a, a new approach where we'll meet together as couples, we'll have dinner together and get accountable on our marriages. And then we'll split up and we'll go to a coffee shop and I'll hang out with him. She'll hang out with his wife and we'll get accountable as, as men and then as women uh, with each other. And it, it's revolutionary, it's transformational. Yeah. And, uh, and the Lord has given us our, our brothers in the body of Christ to help us in that fight and battle. And so men are famous for isolating themselves. They're famous for not getting open and raw, but it's to our detriment. And so that's one of the things I'd encourage the men listening today to do, get with a brother, open your heart up to him, tell him where you've been, what's been going on and to get, then get real accountability and get serious with your sin. Yeah, and I think in my own life, that's for me been uh, so important is to communicate to the men in my life the subtle ways that my own flesh and the devil can assail me. Right. And uh, for me, that means maybe saying no to morally neutral things mm. that can have a detrimental impact on my mind and heart before the Lord. Yeah. It and may maybe mean you don't watch certain show, certain shows or something like that. Or yeah, totally. And you know, um, some some men think that uh, they they can't help it. Other men are deceived in the thinking that they can't fall in that area. Maybe they haven't and they, yeah. they're deceived, but I love what Vody Bauckham said. You know, he said, if you think you can't fall in the sexual sin, in essence, you're saying that you're wiser than Solomon, stronger than Samson and more godly than King David. Yeah. And that, that's, <laughs> that's an eye opener. The, the greatest of men in, in yeah. those different areas have fallen in a sexual sin. Of course you can. And those who say they can't are the ones that often do. And so oh, that's, that's scriptural too. Take yeah. heed lest you fall. Amen. Right? So he who thinks he stand, that's right. And you know, so, and recognize wow. that that uh, you can, and so you need to be wise. And that's one of the schemes yeah. of the enemies. He deceives us into thinking, no, we can stand, and and yeah. um, so we don't take the necessary steps to reinforce ourselves and strengthen ourselves in that area. No, well, easy. Thank you. I'm excited for your book. Again, that's Fight Like a Man, a bold biblical battle plan for personal purity. And that's a key word biblical because, because the world has strategies, our flesh has strategies uh, that wane, our conscience at times wanes, you know, the conviction over sin, we can become desensitized and callous towards sin. Right. Easy, I uh, haven't ever concluded an episode like this, but would you just pray for 
maybe any man seeking purity, um, wanting to honor the Lord, maybe that even feels trapped in sin. Um, would you just pray for us as we conclude this episode and uh, point them to the truth ultimately of God's word and the power of God's spirit? Absolutely, I would be honored, Johnny, thank you. Father, we bring our hearts before you as men. And I know we're doing this, Lord, as we're thousands of miles away from each other. And it can seem like something that it doesn't really have effect in the minds of many, but we recognize that, Lord, you listen to the cries of your people, that even in this very moment, you're attentive to our, our prayers, that, Lord, you affect change through your people, lifting up their voices to you. And we just pray for the men listening right now who are in that place of bondage to sin, who have become willing slaves, Lord. We pray that you would dispel the lies of the enemy in their hearts and minds. We pray that you would reverse the influence of the world. We pray, Lord, that you would give them that self-control reminder and that they possess it, Lord, because it's a part of the fruit of the spirit as they resist the world and its influence. I pray, Father, that you would create deep conviction in the hearts of my brothers listening, that you would infuse in to them a deep sense of hope and that Lord, you would give them that wisdom as they cry out for it, as your word says, you will generously and without reproach and that they would heed that wisdom from above, that Lord, they would be willing to yield to, to truth and that Father, you would delight them as they obey and repent. And I pray that you would restore the, the lives that have been ravaged, the marriages that have been broken. Lord, the, the godly examples that have been marred, I pray you reverse all of that, Lord, and that you would bring sweetness into the lives of my brothers, that this would become a distant memory, uh, one that, that would uh, arise in their minds only to remind them of your goodness and kindness in the way that you delivered them and set them free. And so, we commit all of this to you and ask you to do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Easy, thank you. I would encourage any of you watching or listening to buy Easy's book and go through it both individually or as a small group with a group of men and uh, have that be maybe the starting ground for a plan to keep each other accountable for, for years to come. Easy, thank you for your ministry. Thank you for the burden to write this book and I'm praying that the Lord would bless really the this substantial work that you've put into writing it. So thank you, brother. Thank you, John. It was an honor to be with you, brother. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity and hope the Lord uses this book for his glory. God bless you. All right, you too, brother. 